gentlemen, let's grab our hymn books. We're turning to number uh, 41. Number 41 on your hymn books, Sweet By and By. All standing as we sing number 41 in your hymn book this morning. There's a land that is fairer than day, and by faith we can see it afar, for the Father waits over the way to prepare us a dwelling place there in the sweet by and by. sing a song together. We're going to sing Rolled Away, Rolled Away, Rolled Away. Y'all know that one? I got to do is roll. Not, not roll on the floor. Don't roll on the floor. You'll mess yourself up. Rolled Away. This way, we're going to roll this way. We're going to roll that way. Okay. Whoop. Okay. Exit stage. That's your right, isn't it? Okay. Rolled Away, Rolled Away, Rolled Away. All the burdens of my heart rolled away, rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. All the burdens of my heart rolled away. Every sin had to go neath the crimson flow. Hallelujah, rolled away, rolled away, rolled away. All the burdens of my heart rolled away. Oh, wonderful, beautiful song. Good rolling. Rolling, rolling, rolling. Keep them doggies rolling. There they go. All righty. Excellent singing. So nice to see you all this morning. In case you haven't noticed, we got VBS going on. We got a VBS dump out there, which is wonderful. Um, over the last, uh, I guess the last couple of years, we've had a couple of different churches borrowing our stuff, which is wonderful. I mean, we've got all this uh, VBS materials that we've built and constructed. And, you know, a decade or so ago, I've got a brand new outline. I'm going to get these handed out. Brand new outline. Apost- we have, we're going to teach apostasy this morning in New Testament. Um, no heresy today, apostasy. Um, decades ago... Uh, we would build a lot of VBS stuff, and we had very little storage. And so most of it went over to Denny's house, into his backyard, into his burn pit, and we'd be burning things. Uh, I think we burned the woolly mammoths. Uh, I remember a hippopotamus going up in flames one time. Uh, Just a lot of props and things, because we had zero places to store stuff. And so uh, we put... uh, we put a lot of things up in flames, but uh, several years ago we rented a f- uh, place over here in, in uh, is that Jobstown. We've been storing things. We have some other storage in the back here now, and, and so we've been, uh, instead of throwing things away, we've been accumulating them, which is all well and good. And so uh, a couple years ago, some other churches heard about our, our stuff, and so uh, we've, they've been borrowing some things from us, and uh, that's... Uh, for a, church, uh, a couple of churches, that, that was the walls of Jericho, and they came a-tumbling down. Uh, Derek, you built a lot of those blocks, didn't you? You had a hot, what, like a hot knife, or? Uh, yeah, well, I cut them in half. Oh, is that all you did? I just cut them in half. Yeah. So anyway, they got textured and then painted. It looked like blocks and uh, looked really sharp. And so that, that uh, was the construction for several different props for us over the years. 
And for a couple of churches uh, this, this past VBS season, it was the walls of Jericho. Of course, all the animals we keep now, instead of pitching them, we've got, we've got well, you saw the camels out there and the goats. We have, we've had uh, panthers and lions, and uh, there's an alligator around here somewhere. Um, I forget what else. We've got, we got a full-size horse. Many of you have seen that. It's, uh, I, think it's out by the, I think he hangs out by the baptistry right now. Uh, snakes and quails, and I don't know what else we got. Uh, and so, um, anyway, uh, we've got lots of critters, and I'm glad they're being used. It's a great blessing uh, to know that other churches can use them. And, uh, you know, over the years, we may be, I don't know, maybe starting a uh, VBS rental company or something. Who knows? Um, I, w- I would invite you, please, take your Bible. Brothers, uh, pray for Brother Stephen throughout the morning. And uh, he is um, a good friend of mine, Brother Lee Paulman. He's preached here many times. He's, uh, uh, he's having a grandbaby born coming up real soon. So he and his dear wife and family are making their way to the West Coast uh, for their daughter Sarah's first child. And uh, he needed somebody to fill the pulpit for him this morning. And uh, I recommended Brother Stephen. So he's uh, in Peekskill, New York today, uh, preaching at the Peekskill Baptist Church uh, and so uh, hopefully everything will go well, him and, and Diane and all the youngins. And he sent me a text last night uh, because I had told him about this ice cream store. See, I check out all the great places when I, when I go to, anytime Mrs. Shorter and I get a chance to go somewhere and I get a chance to preach, we always check out the coffee shops. We hit all the coffee shops in town. I'm not talking about Starbucks either. I'm sorry, folks. I'm talking about old-fashioned wooden floor, you know, roasting and uh, type of coffee shops. And then we also uh, find all the uh, Thai food, Mexican food, and then ice cream. So I have a list. And so uh, anyway, there's a great ice cream store there in Peekskill down by the Hudson River. And uh, we had for the first time, I don't know, this was about five or six years ago, lavender ice cream. And it was unbelievably delicious. So I got a text last night from Brother Steven saying lavender ice cream was great. So. Uh, he, he arrives safe. What's that? I would say it tastes like lavender, but it does. You know, it, it, tastes, it, it tastes like lavender. Yeah, lavender is more than a color. It's a plant. And uh, so, yeah, it's got, it's, uh, the, the ice cream itself is kind of a light purplish color. Uh, the other time I've had it was, uh, let me see. Oh, we were out um, in Washington State. We took the ferry out to, was that St. Joseph Island, which is way out in the Sound. And there was an ice cream store out there that happened to have lavender ice cream, so we had it out there too. So I've had it on one coast and the other coast. Like it smells? Uh, it's, yeah, it, uh, it's delicious. You got, it just, I, I don't know, we'll have to find an ice cream. I'm going to have to call uh, Eric, we're going to have to call White Dot and have them make lavender soft serve. That's all there is to it. You get right on that. You talk, you, you talk to Chris. You get your connections, okay, and uh, you talk to Jade, I'll talk to Chris, we'll get it squared away, so, and then we'll all go over to White Dot and eat lavender ice cream, so, anyway, good stuff. Um, first, uh, first Timothy chapter 4 this morning, and uh, uh, we're going to be talking about heresy today, not heresy, excuse me, apostasy, we've been talking about heresy for too long, uh, that one week lesson ended up being like six, I think, but um, hopefully this one won't stretch as long. Um, Please notice uh, in uh, 1 Timothy chapter 4, beginning of verse number 1, the Bible says, Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in a latter time some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, uh, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. And then it begins to talk about some of the... um, False doctrines brewing out of there, forbidding to marry, uh, commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving. Let me, let me just say verse number three there, talking about forbidding for marriage. Did, did Paul ever talk about that? About marriage, ministry, did he ever? Brother Denny's shaking his head yes. Brother Mike's saying yeah. What, 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 was, what was his point? When he said it's, it's good not to marry yet. But Why? Right, but why, why was it good not to marry? Well, because of the present distress. Because of the present distress, yeah. Uh, but uh, one of the things that Paul did say that, yeah, and he was a single man. And so um, the, um, I read this article written by this uh, Episcopalian minute, preacher, and he, he, his article was about the fact that Paul the Apostle was a homosexual. 
I'm just saying, this is where crazy stuff comes from, all right? This, this was, I don't know, a decade or two ago I read that. And I'm thinking, where's this guy coming from? Anyway, and he quoted 1 Corinthians chapter, was that chapter 7, okay? And, um, but Paul, when he, when he makes his point about marriage and not marrying because of the ministry, he says, I don't speak this by command. And one of the, that's a very clear statement that Paul makes. This is not doctrine I'm only suggesting because it's tough out there, and if you want to dive into the ministry full-time and you don't want to have anything to hold you back, then then make that decision not to marry and just just get in the ministry and and preach because there's a lot of distress out there. Paul was very upfront about that. This, as it says in verse number 3, is a doctrinal position that some are taking. In other words, you should not marry, and we're commanding you not to marry. That, that's heresy, okay? And he's using, the, he's using the term, please notice in verse number one, he said, um, departing from the faith. That is apostasy. Faith, departing from the faith, okay? And, and so uh, let me just finish reading down in through verse number three. It says, forbidding to marry, to, uh, abstaining from meat. That's a Jewish traditional thing, uh, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them. Uh, which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God uh, is good and nothing to be refused. Amen to that. It is to be received with thanksgiving. I'm very thankful when I eat dinner. Uh, for, uh, do you say suey? Oh, I'm sorry, slay and eat. Yeah, amen. Okay, I thought you said suey. Anyway, all right, to- tofu turkey just doesn't work for me. I'm just saying. For it is uh, sanctified by the word of God and prayer. Speaking of prayer, let's have a word of prayer and we'll get started with our Sunday school lesson. Father, I do want to thank you, Lord, and what a blessing it is to be able to be together here this Lord's Day, this Sunday morning. We can be at Sunday school. I do pray for Brother Stephen, Sister Diane, and the kids, and pray it be a great experience for them. And, and Lord, that you would, um, as you've led them to preach your word uh, in different messages throughout this day, I pray, Father, be a help and an encouragement to that church and a great encouragement to Brother Stephen. Now, thank you, Lord, for this time we have together. Bless it, use it to accomplish your will. In Jesus' name, amen, amen. I want to talk about apostasy. In that particular verse of Scripture that we just looked at, it talks about departing from the faith. You'll notice uh, a definition there. That's the word apostasy is it, um, that we would have in our Bibles. And uh, you'll see the Greek word there. The, 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 it's a combined word, apo, like apostle, uh, uh, apostle, you know, a sent one. So you get the idea of, of from, going from. And, um, and so that's the apo part of apostasy. And the other is the histomy, and that is to take a stand. You'll see that word histomy all throughout the New Testament as far as translated in many different ways, taking a stand for something, being in a position, standing firm. It's, there's a lot of words connected with it. But when you put it with apo, you have this idea, you used to stand here, and now you are from where you used to stand. The idea of apostasy is a, is a little different than heresy. We can, and I just be honest with you, I combine those two terms all the time. I don't really see a lot of difference. I understand technically there is a difference, but we use the terms almost interchangeably. I just want to read um, the definition. I probably read this over a month ago. It's from uh, um, uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer. Brother Sh- uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer was the professor at Dallas Theological Seminary. Uh, for like forever, uh, tremendous theological work that he's written on systematic theology. This is what he writes. Apostasy describes someone uh, who, was first in, who first embraced some doctrine and afterwards turned from it, a total departure from the faith, whereas heresy is a belief which is held that is contrary to the, and he puts it in quotes, standards or accepted feature of doctrine. And so uh, Lewis Berry Schaefer, of course, making that distinction between apostasy and heresy, and rightfully so, there is a difference. But as we talk about apostasy, apostasy today, we are talking about this idea of, of being right and then turning from that, and now you're, now you're taking a position which is, which is wrong. Um, as we talked about heresy, um, talked about different kind of levels of heresy where, it, you know, needles out at damnable heresy. Other heresies are just you know, some differences that we have in our belief system. When we talk about apostasy, generally we're talking about something that is so far removed that it would end up being damnable, where you're believing or teaching something which uh, you know, diminishes the opportunities of someone 
receiving the true gospel. And so, um, so usually when we talk about apostasy, we're talking about totally turning from the truth, okay? Um, now, I, I want to start off by saying that Paul the Apostle was, was, was um, accused of apostasy. And, and you'll see that reference down there. It's in Acts chapter 21. And if you'll turn there with me, what's interesting about this portion of Scripture is that he is actually being accused of apostasy by believers in the church in Jerusalem. And so the, uh, Paul, of course, is an apostle to the Gentiles. That's where his ministry has been. And while he's out preaching in many other places, a lot of Gentiles are getting saved. There are still a lot of Jewish communities all throughout those areas. That's why Paul often, you'll see in his epistles, making reference to both Jews and Gentiles. He talks about that middle wall of, per, uh, of, of partition uh, in the book of Ephesians, which has been removed between Jew and Gentile. That's why he says we have one faith, one Lord, one baptism. His point was, is that we don't have a different Jewish religion than we have a Gentile religion. You're all together in the same church. You're all saved the same way. And he, uh, he talks about that often in his epistles. And as you read through his, the book of Acts, you see very clearly uh, there's a lot of communities he was in where he was button heads with the Jewish community. He'd go in there, preach in the synagogues. They, they'd kind of say, hey, this is, I've never heard this kind of stuff before. And as soon as the Gentiles started expressing an interest, the Jews saying, we don't like this. And so there was a lot of problems he had with that. This statement is made in Acts 21, verse number 21. And they, this is, this is James, the pastor of the church, that's there in Jerusalem, and um, he is talking to Paul, and, um, and, and they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children, neither to walk after the customs. And, and so you, you see this, um, this accusation uh, that's being made against Paul the Apostle. And you'll see that word, you see that word forsake? It says forsake Moses. That's the same word that we get the word apostasy from or to turn from. And so, what the, the, of course, the accusation is, is that Paul was teaching things that were apostate. Now, the accusation, of course, is not against Christianity per se, but against the Jewish laws now, Paul, he is, you know, as he's going to be in those, gen, in those Gentile communities letting folks know that, listen, you don't have to follow the rituals of the Old Testament um, and, and the rites of circumcision and all those things that went along with Old Testament theology. You don't have to buy into that. Uh, the, the Jews do that, but you don't have to. And so the accusation is that they're, he's preaching against the laws of Moses. And, of course, now, you know, that the Jews are being encouraged to do the same thing. And so, so uh, this is just, it's a strange thing when you consider it. But Paul was accused of being apostate. Um, of course, he was not. He's preaching the truth. And so when I read that, what it reminds me of is even when, for instance, I believe I preach the truth. Um, but there are going to be folks that are going to look at me and hear me and hear what we preach and say, you guys are like way off base. And they're going to, they're going to, anybody who preaches the truth is going to be accused of all kinds of things. But sometimes people that preach the truth are accused of apostasy. And so the word gets thrown around a lot. Paul was not an apostate. And, uh, of course, after this particular verse, he's encouraged to do some things and ends up getting arrested and thrown in prison. And that whole two and a half years of, um, of stuff and imprisonment goes on in his life. And so, um, so apostasy um, is a word that is often thrown around incorrectly, especially when it comes to those that are actually preaching the truth. So... Um, uh, if you, um, I, I know Brother Stephen showed me, sh has showed me some messages of them, some things that we do a lot of, you know, we're increasing our online presence, uh, which is interesting. I, I just kind of throw this in real quick. Um, I, f I found a golf ball this past week, all right, because 
Okay, there are times where I'm golfing and I just happen to shoot a golf ball like into the woods, deep into the woods. And, you know, and so I will go searching for it because I'll do anything not to get an extra uh, shot on my scorecard. So anyway, so I was, I was digging, I was digging through, I need to put a machete in my golf bag is what I need to do. But I was digging through the woods the other day looking for a golf ball and I found my golf ball and I found another one. And what got me, my interest is it had, uh, had like a, a business logo on one side and I flipped it over on the other side. Golf ball do have sides, by the way. And I'm looking on the other side and it had a QR code. And I thought, this is, this will be fun. So as soon as I got home, I, you know, flashed the, uh, uh, my cell phone on it and got the QR code. It was, uh, it's a lawyer uh, from Haddonfield. And uh, it's like, I'm terrible. It, it, it's, it's his, it's his, um, on, it's his online um, business card. Uh, Buzz has the technical term for it. I don't know, but it's the QR code. It brings up his business card. I'm terrible at golf. And uh, all, all of his contact information, he does all kinds of law services and things like that. Con, you know, phone numbers, websites, Facebook page, Instagram, the whole thing. So I, I sent him, a, I sent him a, um, a, f a Facebook message. I said, I, uh, with the picture, I found your golf, your golf ball. And he says, he, he says, yeah, Lord knows I lose a lot of them. Hope you do better with it than I did. And so, but it's interesting that, um, you know, um, when you, when you increase your online presence, you don't know what kind of people you're going to hit, okay? So this lawyer didn't know he was going to hit me with his uh, advertisement on a golf ball that he lost in the woods over in Springfield uh, Golf Place there. But um, as we increase our online presence, it's amazing the kind of uh, uh, feedback we get. And Brother Stevens shows me some of the stuff every once in a while, and it gets pretty harsh sometimes. Um, because there's a lot of accusation of apostasy. And because most people who are, I'll put it this way, most people that are in a wrong position look at a right position as being apostasy. Um, historically, you know, um, I, look at, I look at the Bible and I say, well, we're trying to, we're trying to stay in a position that is, that is as close to center on what this book says. And anyone that's not on center with this book says has gone away from it. But if they've been away from it for so long, they think they're center. Sure. And, and so um, it's, it's, it is amazing um, how much accusations are thrown around concerning apostasy. But I mean, our goal, of course, is to be, as I said, on center with what this book says. So let me, we're going to talk about apostasy this morning. Uh, we read this verse in 1 uh, Timothy chapter 4, but I want you to go with me to uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Apostasy is often related to end time events, and, and rightfully so. The Bible does speak about this. Uh, 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. <coughs> Second, there we go. Took a wrong turn. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. And I'm going to start, we'll start at the beginning of that chapter. Finally, brethren, uh, pray for us that the Word of God, that's chapter 3, I beg your pardon. There we go, chapter 2. Uh, now we beseech you, brethren, by the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ and by our gathering together unto Him. Okay, so we're talking about, you know, Christ's return, the saints of God being gathered to Him. Um, that ye be not soon shaken in mind or troubled, neither by spirit or by word, nor by letter, as from us. So there's a lot of false teaching going on. There's a lot of presentation of truth, which is an error being misrepresented. That's going, this is first century kind of stuff, that the day of Christ is at hand. So um, do you believe that Jesus could come back any time? I, I certainly believe that, okay? We, we talked about that years ago. We started that series on end time events and that, uh, that anticipation of Christ's return, the imminent, it's called the doctrine of imminency, the imminent return of Christ. He can come at any time, okay? Um, and so he's, Paul is not denying the, uh, that doctrine of imminency. What he's talking about is the fact that some people were at the point in the first century where they're saying, okay, um, Christ is coming back at any time, so 
quitting my job, not paying my bills. Uh, we're just going to sit around and wait for Jesus because he's come back any time. All right. Um, I do believe he's come back at any time, but I am not going to encourage you to uh, quit your job and sit around and wait for Jesus. Okay. Um, any time could be 100 years from now. Uh, if you remember back in, was it uh, when Harold Camping did his Lost in the Woods while camping doctrine of the return of Christ? Uh, there's a lot of people that um, sold everything, sent the money off to um, uh, Family Radio, um, and helped promote his end time doctrinal stuff. And they're just sitting around on, on May 21st. Is that, was that 2001, I think it was? Or was that, it hasn't been 20 years. Yeah, I forget what date that was. But anyway, they're just sitting around waiting for Jesus, you know? That's what Paul's talking about. It's that type of theology that people had. Okay? And, and one of the things that Paul says about that, he said, Let no man deceive you, verse number three, by any means, that the day shall not come except there be a falling away first. That word falling away is apostasy. There's going to be a great apostasy. And that the man of sin be revealed. That's talking about the Antichrist. And, this, uh, and this, uh, the son of perdition. Um, and then he goes on to talk about the Antichrist, talking about the taking out of the Holy Spirit. There's a lot of doctrinal information here about end times and such, about the loss, and about this, uh, you know, believing a lie and all those type of things. But it's interesting that apostasy is related to the end times. Now, that does not mean that there's no apostasy before that time, but those that go away from the faith will increase greatly as we get closer to those end times. That verse of scripture we started with in 1 Timothy chapter 4 talks about that, thing, that, that particular thing, this, uh, this departing from the faith. Um, uh, apostasy is not something new. We're going to talk about that in just a little bit. But uh, apostasy is one of those things that continues on and on and on. Uh, but there is going to be a greater apostasy as the end time comes. Okay, Now, the, um, the apostasy is, of course, a result of bad teaching. In, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, just a few pages over for, uh, for most of us here, um, 2 Timothy chapter 4, uh, you'll notice uh, here in verse number 4, and it says this, And they shall turn away their ears from the truth, and shall be turned to fables. But watch thou in all things, enduring affliction." Um, You'll, and, and that's Paul's instruction, of course, to Timothy to, be, to watch and endure. But you'll notice that uh, phrase there in verse number four, that they shall turn away. That turning away is that, again, it's that word that we, you'll see at the top of the page there, apostasy. Um, that's that word that's, uh, that's mentioned there. Um, they, they turn, the, the Bible says they turn their ears away from truth. And so um, if they're not going to listen to truth, they're going to listen to error. They're gonna, and, and so apostasy is not simply a result of people saying, well, I don't, I don't believe this anymore, and they, you know, they take a step away. Uh, what generally happens is, is they stop listening to the truth, and they start listening to error, and they get sucked right into it. it happens a lot. I remember um, when we first moved here, um, got the ministry started, we purchased this particular facility. There were several church families that were still left here, very few, but some of them, um, you know, we, we came, as, came to be a part of New Testament Baptist Church. Others, you know, we reached out to, encouraged them to either get in some churches or whatever. I remember one guy, his, his, his first name was Pete. Uh, he had a son, Pete, also, and they used to call him Repeat. I'm, I'm not kidding about that. It was a joke for them. It was a joke for everyone, but it's, it's true. And so, anyway, uh, I remember talking to Pete, and uh, he was... Um, uh, very, very zealous man uh, with the ministry, um, and I would run into him often. He lived locally. We talked a lot. He was talking about some particular, and I can't remember the name of the particular movement that he was uh, talking about, but he got sucked into this almost like a cultic kind of movement and just really got him away from the things of the Lord. He was very zealous for the things, very evangelistic, and he just started listening to some bad teaching, got sucked right out of good churches. I don't know what's happened to him. I don't know where he's at. 
um, nowadays, but it's just a shame. And that was, you know, 20 plus years ago, but still, uh, it happens all the time. People get sucked out of good churches, and it's because they, they turn away from truth, and as soon as they do that, they get, they get turned onto fables, and that's what sucks them in. So, um, that uh, particular, uh, I get that other reference here in Titus chapter 1. Let me just read that. And giving heed to Jewish fables, the commandments of men that, uh, that turn from the truth. Again, it's the same, idea, the same thing about apostasy is that they turn um, from truth. Uh, they, and so they're, now they're turning towards, as this says, Jewish fables and commandments of men. So traditions. And, um, and things generated from men philosophy, um, and, and they get drawn into those things. And so um, apostasy is the result of bad teaching. And of course, you know, the bad teaching is not something certainly new to us. It's been around a long time. I, I wanted to take a few minutes um, and go to the book of Revelation, if you would, please. These are, these are mentioned here, Revelation chapter 2. And um, these are some of the letters. That was great messages, brother. Um, my brother Summerdor p- preached last week. Of course, he spent uh, one night here in the Book of Revelation, and, and um, as in these chapters here, talking about the seven, ch- uh, the letters to the seven churches, just extracting some great teaching from that. Some wonderful messages. That message he preached about giving God glory. Uh, what day was that? Was that Monday? Was that Tuesday? I think it was Tuesday. Man, that was a tremendous message. That was. Um, you know, if I was going to pick a favorite, I'd pick that one. It was it was a tremendous sermon that night. Um, anyway, um, you'll notice uh, the Nicolaitans are mentioned here. Um, verse uh, chapter two, verse number six is the letter of the church in, to Ephesus, where it says, uh, "But this thou hast that thou hatest the deeds of the Nicolaitan Nicolaitans." Wow, I can't even pronounce that. Uh, which I do hate. It's meant, they are mentioned again over verse number 15, which is the letter to the church of Pergamos. And you'll see it again. So hast thou also them that hold to the doctrine of Nicolaitan, um, which things I hate. He mentions it again. Now, that, this is one of the uh, false doctrines uh, of the early church. There's not a lot definitive about that. Uh, about what they taught. Now, if you would keep your place here, go with me to Revelation, excuse me, to Acts chapter 6. And uh, the only reason I ask you to do that is only because there's a name there, and, and that's all. And you'll notice that list of um, uh, in the early church there in Jerusalem, and they were selecting, um, uh, selecting uh, men to be um, apost- uh, the first deacons. Let's see here. There they are. Verse number five, um, the saying pleased the whole multitude. This is uh, six five, in, in the book of Acts. And they chose Stephen, a man. Everybody knows who Stephen is. Of course, he got he gets the the next the whole chapter for his sermon. Um, a man full of faith and the Holy Ghost, and Philip, and um, Prochorus, and Nicanor, uh, and Timon, and Parmenius, and Nicholas a proselyte of Antioch. Okay, so Nicholas is mentioned there. There's a lot of folks that connect Nicholas here in, in Acts chapter 6 to the doctrine of Nicolaitans. I don't know if that's true or not. There's no, there's no historical connection between there, only, uh, only a, a name reference. Okay, the word, the word itself, okay. Um, has anyone ever owned a pair of Nike sneakers? Anyone? A few folks, okay. Um, the, the word Nike uh, for your sneakers, that's, of course, rooted back to Latin, rooted back to the Greek. And the Greek, that word Nike, means victory. Um, the, um, uh, it was the, what was the, it was the Battle of the- uh, Thermopolis when the Persians invaded the Greek, island, the Greek peninsula. And, the, of course, the Greeks won. And it was, oh, what was that guy's name? Thermopolis? Anyway, he runs that 23 miles all the way back to, Ant, uh, to Athens and cries out, victory, and then Nike, and then dies. That's a great story, isn't it? Um, anyway, um, so that word Nike means victory. Okay, So Nicholas is one who has victory. The Nicolaitans are those who, and this is the, this is the translation that you will often read in most lexicons and things, or, 
uh, Greek, Greek um, de- uh, dictionaries, is victory over the people. And so the general consensus of the doctrine of Nicolaitans is this, uh, this created division between the clerical and the laity, okay? Um, um, the, the idea that there's this separation now, all right? So I, I am now ruling over you <laughs> as if I'm something special. And, and so that is often the idea that is being presented here. Like, again, there's not, a lot of, there's not a lot of historical information about this. So a lot of it's driven by just by definition, uh, etymology, by definition of the word, where it came from. Um, but it certainly is, it has to be noted. Now, if it's, if it's rooted back to, ask, to that guy Nicholas, that proselyte, uh, who became a deacon, maybe he just took a little bit more upon himself and, you know, started promoting this idea of this, you know, kind of a ruling class in the churches. Because that doctrine is alive and kicking today. <laughs> In most religions that have a structure like that, you know, I was, you know, coming from Catholicism. Okay, um, here you are in your church. You had a priest. You had a monsignor. Monsignors kind of run over a couple. Of, and then you had a bishop who oversaw many, uh, you know, many uh, dioceses. Okay. Uh, then above that, in, in many of the major cities, there was cardinals, and they oversaw many of the bishops. And then cardinals, and you had. Uh, there was, there was, there's another layer of cardinals, kind of a governing body, but the cardinals would have a, you know, this, this would be responsible to the pontiff, the pope. And so you have this structure, and it's a, it's a leadership structure which is created by man. But it's a, that would be the doctrine of the Nicolaitans. And so, uh, and so that was in the early church. Um, and if that's what it was, if it was a hierarchy structure of, of taking authority over other people, um, that is something that I guess even, even a good Baptist church could, could be in danger of. When, when a preacher thinks, or not even a preacher, but you know, you got a board of deacons that, you know, we just kind of run things. Deacon boards that, that's kind of run things. And there's a lot, of, a lot of that that happens in churches where you have a structure in place that kind of runs everything and rules over people. Um, all right. I've seen that in churches. I've seen the good, the bad, the ugly of it. You have too. Some, you know, good structure in the church. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, the office of a deacon is a servant. It's not, it's not a ruling body. It was never intended that way. Um, the, um, uh, there are pastors that take tremendous uh, authority over people's lives. I know of preachers, I know, and you probably do, I know of preachers that exercise so much authority over people that they're not even allowed to marry unless the pastor approves who they're marrying. And, and stuff like that. Um, Anyway, we can go on and tell stories, but I'm not going to. All right. So, Doctrine of Nicolaitans, you'll see that mentioned there in those two particular, and I think it's interesting because it's mentioned, it's mentioned twice within those churches. So, apparently, it was a real problem. And you'll notice that it says, it very clearly, it says the doctrine of the Nicolaitan. It, it, when it says doctrine, that, that, just is, that doesn't mean just a following. It means it's, it's promoted as teaching. So there's structure to it. People are being taught that this is what the Bible says. And so it's drawing people away. You'll, I, and I just want to mention this. I, I put it down there, the doctrine of Balaam. It's mentioned in 2.14. This is still in the, in, in the church in Pergamos. Where it says, uh, but I have a few things against thee because thou hast them that hold to the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Now, we're not going to go back there, but that's, of course, that's um, uh, back in uh, the book of Numbers. um, Numbers chapter um, uh, 20. I wrote all these references down here. Okay. 
Um, Numbers chapter 25, you have Baal, the story of Balaam and Balak. It goes for several chapters. Children of Israel are coming out of Egypt. They're coming through. Um, you know, they crossed over. So now they'll be going through the land of the Edomites and the Moabites and, the, and all the other ites as they're making their way up the western side uh, along the you know, Dead Sea, Jordan River, up, up that direct before they cross over to the Jericho. <coughs> and so as they're going through there, um, you know, Balaam is there, and he's supposed to curse the nation of Israel. It doesn't happen. Of course, all these great things, and God delivers them. And it's wonderful, except when you get to Baal Peor. <laughs> and um, that, that area of Peor, that's where that's, uh, uh, Balaam had built seven altars there, and he was supposed to curse the nation of Israel. It didn't happen. But what he did do, and I'm, I'm going to read this. This is from Numbers 31, 16. And behold, these caused the children of Israel through the counsel of Balaam to commit trespass against the Lord in the manner of Peor. And there was a plague among the congregation of the Lord. And so what happened was at, at Peor, they put together a kind of a pagan worship kind of feast. And often with Baal worship, there was a lot of immorality, sexual immorality that they uh, meshed together with their idolatry. And so the children of Israel were exposed to that and got drawn right into it. And Balaam had a lot to do with that. It would be kind of like Balaam going over to Balak, the king of the Moabites, and saying, listen, I, you know, I tried to curse these guys. It wouldn't happen. God's on their side. I can't do this. But, you know, I, I do know <laughs> that if you throw anything in front of them that's immoral, they'll get sucked right into it. Oh, what a great idea. And so that's exactly what he does. They put together this big worship to Baal, and they get sucked right into it. Um, it's mentioned here in the church in Pergamos, and it's a doctrine, the teachings, okay? So, you know, we, again, doesn't go into detail. We don't have a lot of, you know, outside information to kind of define our, our things here, but the idea would be this lack of separation of God's children from the immorality of this world. And it's kind of like saying, well, you know, some of you, some of you folks in church, you're just so, you're just so rigid. You, you're, you, know, you know, doesn't the Bible give us some liberties that we can enjoy some things in this world without being so hard-nosed about stuff? And they're teaching, they're teaching liberty and freedom and the, the idea that we can enjoy some of this world and not be so, so you know, hard-pressed against, you know, against uh, you know, some of the enjoyment that the world has to offer. And they kind of swing the door wide open to allow immorality into the church. And it just, people's lust just suck them right into it. So as, as soon as somebody starts talking about, you know, I just feel like I've got, I really got the freedom to do these things. As soon as, they, as soon as they get this thought in their minds, they get sucked right into the doctrine of Balaam. So anyway, these, these two are mentioned very specific. The doctrine of Nicolaitan and the doctrine of Balaam are mentioned. This is early church. We're talking about apostasy. And, um, and you know, God brings it up through the apostle John as he's writing these letters saying, I've got problems with this. And, I'm, and especially with the Nicolaitans, he said, these things I hate. Um, because of how destructive they are to the churches, if, if that's what it is, this idea of this hierarchy or, or, or you know, a, a, of, a, of a type of leadership which takes control. It's kind of like Demetrian and the, uh, that John writes about, who, you know, just kind of like, I want to have the preeminence. And that kind of stuff just eats a church up. And so anyway... Um, he, uh, we're talking about apostasy. We're talking about things that draw people away from, from being center on the Word of God. And certainly these two things are mentioned. Um, I, I, okay. Okay. This is, I have this. This, this has not been in my heresy box because I just got my hands on it the other day. All right. Um, two of my grandchildren were at a, was it the public library? I'm not going to tell you who my grandchildren were that found this, but was it at the public library? Which, where was it? It was a little take-a-book, leave-a-book thing in the park. Oh, okay. 
Not that it was her name. No, no, it was. It was Dean and Phoebe. They were, hang, they were hanging out in the park. And they, you ever see one of those little boxes, take a book, leave a book? Okay. Well, they were perusing through it, and they saw this. And they mentioned it to me. And they said, because well, it says poems, piety, and psyche, uh, progressive poems for rebellious Christians. Okay. And so they read, they saw the title, and they thought, they said, I don't know if it's good or bad. You know, I said, well, get the book, and let me see. You know? I said, worst case, it ends up in my heresy box. You know? So anyway, they brought it home. Um, uh, and so, um, uh, I, I've not read the whole, I've read a couple of the poems, they're, they're kind of interesting, but anyway, this is written by a, um, an Anglican minister, spent 40 years as a minister in the Anglican Church, Church of England, okay, and, um, and I'm just going to, this is the preface, you should always read book prefaces, okay, you get a lot of information in prefaces, and th- I'm just going to read a couple paragraphs in the preface, um, the first couple of paragraphs he's talking about when he was younger in the ministry and, and uh, talking about marketing the church and things like that. Uh, but the church has been unable to absorb the teaching of biblical criticism, the reality of evolution, and the false idea of a God up there, um, and accept that, that Christianity must adapt and incorporate these ideas just as any scientifically educated 20-year-old does. There are, in my poems, an emphasis on the teaching of the historical Jesus while rejecting the miracles of the virgin birth of his physical resurrection. Jesus was divine in the same sense that we see God in him and in the same sense, though in a greater degree, as in the lives of all holy men and women and each other if we look close enough. The social issues of the day are equally avoided by the church as it still battles with how human beings manage their relationships. Second marriages, female priests and bishops, sex outside of marriage, and the LBTQ community uh, community continues to occupy the minds of church authorities as the population walks on by without a glance in their direction. And so um, this is apostasy, okay? I'm not sure, I'm not saying the Church of England always stood for truth. I mean, there's some good, if you go way back, there's some good Anglican writers, some wonderful materials that I've read from Anglican folks uh, over the years. But this is just saying, I don't believe any of it. Don't believe the virgin birth, don't believe the physical resurrection. Didn't we just read about that in 1 John? about those that deny the physical resurrection of Jesus Christ. If Christ be not risen from the dead, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians, then then we're all, we're hopeless, you know. And uh, and so he denies it all. And uh, he has this nice collection of poems that make us feel good about it. So what, what what his whole premise is, is that the Anglican church is missing out on trying to attract society into into its doors. And so if we would only lower our belief and start stop emphasizing all this doctrine that we would attract more people in. That's apostasy. And, and so anyway, um, thank you for the book. It's going it's going in the heresy box. Yes, sir. I have never read the 31 articles of faith of the uh, of the Anglican Church. Spot on. Yeah, I, I would not. Like four. Yeah. And then those four. Well, they're. Drive this guy. Yeah, they they uh, they would be. Um, they believe in sacraments. They believe in sacraments. They believe in sacraments. Read to the thirty-nine yeah. articles. It's not quite the same as the Catholic Church. Right. And then they say, well, yeah, it is. So they're like the Pope is the Antichrist. I mean, they're you know, sure because they, they, they got their own Pope. Yeah, the. Uh, he uh, says, are you justified by faith? Yes, you're justified by faith. Uh, you can be saved uh, but without works. Yes, you can be saved without uh, works. But you have to be baptized. Well, yeah, kind of. Well, yeah, kind of. It's like Lutheran's small catechism. Yeah. Luther, Luther believed that you had yeah. to be baptized to be saved. That's what it says. Yeah. The... Uh, I was going through a library one time, I ran across the Shorter Catechism. That got my attention. And that, all that was an abbreviated catechism, I believe, with what you're talking about. Yeah. And, and so um, I, w- I want to read, um, this, is, um, um, this is Justin Martyr, okay, uh, first cent- uh, second century. He, um, he would be, um, 
I'm trying to remember when he died. It would be like 150, 160, that, that time frame. Um, but we're talk, you know, talking about um, apostasy. Um, this is early statements. So this is, of course, he, he writes to, um, he writes to uh, Marcus Aurelius. Um, he's got great things about defending Christianity uh, in the Roman Empire. Wonderful stuff. But this is what he mentions about baptism in particular. He says, um, I will next describe the manner in which, uh, of course, this, this, so this is written probably 140, 150 A.D., okay? I will next describe the manner in which uh, we who have uh, been made new through Christ um, dedicated ourselves to God, lest by admitting it, it seemed to be giving you, an, um, giving you an imperfect account of us. As many as are persuaded and believe that what we teach and say is true, and undertake to live according to the instructed, uh, are instructed to pray and entreat with fasting God's forgiveness of our past sins while we pray and fast with them. Then again, in the same manner in which we ourselves are reborn, uh, in the name of God, the Father of our of Lord of all, and our Savior Jesus Christ and the Holy Ghost, they then receive the washing with water. So he's talking about baptism, okay? Um, this is um, um, what, um, what Justin Martyr does is he begins to associate the baptism with the washing away of sins. Now, we know, of course, it's a picture of what Christ has done, but what he's saying is that where he's at, as far as his early church here, is that they began to confuse the two. Then they are brought by us where there is water and are born again in the same manner in which we ourselves were reborn. Okay? Um, our washing is called enlightenment because those who learn these things have their understanding enlightened. In the name of Jesus Christ also, who, has, who was crucified by Pontius Pilate, and in the name of the Holy Spirit, by, who by the prophets foretold all things of Jesus, the enlightened one receives his washing. And, and so there is a, there, um, you know, when you read this, you think, well, he's not talking about baptismal regeneration. He's saying, you know, the fact that, you know, when folks get saved, when folks are getting saved, they just take them down this great connection. Most of the time when you look in the scripture, you see folks that are getting saved and immediately they're getting baptized. You know, the, the Ethiopian eunuch, here's water. What does him mean to get baptized? Do you believe? I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Then he baptized him. Right. Directly associated. Uh, by this time, the line is getting kind of blurry. Right. One of the early apostasies of the church is, the, uh, is the, that removal of that line. Uh, where uh, you see people getting baptized directly associated with salvation. And that line then continues to move over even further. And, 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 by, uh, and by the, um, uh, when you get into the, the closer to the third century, um, you have um, then this teaching that uh, the church has the ability of bringing someone into the family of God through baptism. The church then baptizes and brings salvation. And, of course, the Roman Catholic Church, that, that they, they, just, they just took that line and kept moving it further and further over. And so uh, baptismal regeneration became a horrendous apostasy, uh, which continues on today. And, of course, after a while, it's like, well, if, if baptism is what saves people, then the earlier we baptize them, the better. And so infant baptism became the next logical step to that process. Yes, sir, we have 30 seconds. Constantine had that quandary even when they were dealing with the bishops. He said, if I have to get baptized to be saved, mm -hmm. and yet if I fall away, it's impossible to renew me to repentance, uh -huh. I better get baptized just prior to me dying. And that is exactly what Constantine did. He waited till the last minute in order to get baptized so all of his sins would be removed. Yeah. Exactly right. <laughs> And, and you see, and, and so Constantine, he's what, 100 years uh, after a Justin Martyr, and so you see how far the line got. This is early apostasy, and uh, it's, it's away from the truth. The, the only remedy, we didn't even get to the last verse here, the only remedy for apostasy is good Bible 
teaching. I'm going to end right there. Thank you very much for being in Sunday school this morning.